Welcome to our exploration on romance. That's right. We're going to be talking about Christian discipleship at the intersection of relationships and sexuality. Yeah, it's a complex subject. So we're going to start by rooting ourselves first in God's design. What did God intend for romantic love? What did God intend for sexuality? I think we'll all be very encouraged by where this conversation starts. It starts in the garden. Let's read here in Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image and our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Did you guys catch that? We are made in the image of God. And we could unpack this idiom, but here in Genesis, we see it reused later. Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, in a relationship between Adam and his third son, Seth. We know that it means family. In the ancient Near Eastern context, this would have also carried the connotation of being a royal ambassador. Those considerations and the fact that the word image means a statue. It's actually a word that's associated with the image of cult idols, and I know that sounds weird, but it means statue, like a representative statue of a living God. God has made us living statues. So let that inform at the outset the fact that our bodies and the way that we're made, male and female, these are designed in, in full to represent God himself. Your body who you are here as is not an item of shame, but in fact a way that God mediates his presence through the world. Are you ready to continue? With that in mind, let's move forward. You see that command to be fruitful. Well, it implies what you think it might imply. How are humans made? It sure ain't that. Here at the outset, that humans were designed to represent God as his living, breathing statues, mediating his presence, how do more people arrive? It's done in a deep partnership between God and his people. Couples, covenant love, having sex. Let's read about this for Adam and Eve. Are you ready? Genesis chapter 2. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. You see this bone of bone, flesh of flesh. Uh, commentators observe that this is a covenant formula, a common reciprocal loyalty. Here at the outset, the proliferation of God's image. How are more humans made? Having sex. It's a deep partnership between God and a covenanted couple. A couple that is committed to covenant love. They are now one. And so here in the design of romance, we find not only that God is representing himself through a community, through male and female, but we also find that somehow there is both two-ness and oneness at the same time. Later on, theologians will call this attribute of God the Trinity, as we understand God's triune nature. He is somehow three and one. And so romance here at the very foundations of romance, we find that God is partnering with man and woman in a structure that is somehow unified and yet distinct. We call this marriage. God's original design for romance, for sexuality, is seen here in the garden. If we just take a look back, we have the idea of a man and a woman together in covenant bond, loving one another in loyalty. 
we have this idea of this covenant relationship that somehow two become one and yet are still two. Bone of bone, flesh of flesh, they became one. The ideal of romance is not the loss of ourselves in someone else, but the fulfillment of a covenant where two become one. So there's also this shamelessness. Did you notice this? They were naked and they had no shame. That God's design for romance, no matter how much it's been hijacked by sin, which we'll explore later, it starts with this. Shamelessness. That the togetherness, that sexuality is not only an intimate place where God's images are made. What a partnership. But it is also a place where there exists, should be, by design, no shame. And it's also a place of fruitfulness, that this is actually how God's family grows. What a dignified role of sexuality here at the very beginnings of the Bible. We need to keep this in mind when we look at God's design for sexuality. Sex is not shameful. God designed it for covenant intimacy. We also need to realize that sex is not sinful. God designed it to express love and grow his family. Now, just as anything in creation can be hijacked for other purposes than God's, so we need to consider these things at the outset of our exploration, framing our conversation about sexuality, that within God's design, we realize that, that this is not something that uh, gets painted as negative. And I feel like too often in the conversations that Christians emphasize because they want to maintain purity and they want to aim for Christian discipleship, and we are going to explore that, they forget the foundations. The foundations of sex are good, honorable, and even a divine partnership that actually enables the spread of the image of God. Sex is a gift. It is something that God designed from the very beginning, a, in a place before sin, in a place before the fall, in a place before brokenness. Sex existed in a way that honored and bore witness to the very character of God. So it's no surprise then that the positive imagery of sexuality as a way of understanding our very relationship with God gets picked up throughout the Old and New Testaments. The idea of a covenant, it becomes a metaphor, this idea of marriage. And we see in Exodus chapter 19, we see that God is proposing to his people, will you be for me a kingdom of priests? And he asks them, he invites them. And this whole covenant framework that we read after this, Exodus 20, where the Ten Commandments are, and then you get this picture of, of the tabernacle. And God is coming to live with his people. That original marriage that we see with Adam and Eve, a man leaving his household to be with his wife and the two become one. In some way, we could see God's relationship with his people in the same way, that he would leave the heavens, so to speak, to dwell in a tent. And in that tent is imagery of the garden, that what we see in the garden, this intimacy between God and this covenant relationship intimacy between people, that that's what we were designed for. And so God recalls that in the very tabernacle, that he is coming to dwell and restore that which was dwelling in the garden. We see it vibrantly in Ezekiel 16, and the prophets pick up this metaphor of marriage as a way to explore the relationship between God and his people. And sometimes, like in Jeremiah, for example, it's under the context of Israel's disobedience. But let me remind you that in order to assess Israel as a covenant partner, aka in marriage with God, marriage holds a high view, romance, desire. It's part of God's relationship with his people, and thus something that is not done away with when we come to Christ, but is actually fulfilled. We see this in Hosea, where Hosea is actually invited to represent the very painful marriage of God through his wife, Gomer, and his life, 
his life story was an attempt to capture the pain and the challenge of the relationship that God had with his own people. But you see, it's built on the positive metaphor of marriage. That marriage somehow, that unique thing that's happening, that happened in the garden between man and woman, typifies and gives us a preview of what God wants to do in our relationship with him. We need to realize this, that romance as designed by God, marriage designed by God, sexual desire and fulfillment designed by God, it's supposed to bear witness to him. It, we can glorify God in our sexuality. Again, sexuality is not bad or negative or broken. It's all touched by the fall and we're going to explore that, but I, I need you to hear this loud and clear. That sex, the way God designed it, is important to him. And it actually shows his character. But it is more than a metaphor. We read in Song of Songs, if you really want to get some romantic literature in your reads, uh, don't pick up a, one of those paperback novels. Just visit the Song of Songs. It's one steamy book of the Bible. I highly recommend the Bible Project video on this book. Check it out on YouTube. These guys do the Lord's work. Really poetic and vibrant relationship between this couple that we read in Song of Songs. In fact, the Song of Songs is this unabashed celebration of romantic and sexual desire. It is something that actually brings glory to God. It can. It's more than a metaphor. Let's read here in Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 6 through 7. Set me as a seal upon your heart, is a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his spouse, he would be utterly despised. Do you guys hear this high view of romantic love? That it is the very flame of the Lord? See, love is something we should not be afraid of. Yes, all of our faculties, all of what we are, all of our relationships have been touched by the fall. But to encounter God is to rediscover and redeem the flame of love. And so if, if you're ever in question as to whether or not sexuality is something that can honor God, I encourage you, read the Song of Songs. There's a reason they call it the Song of Songs. It's a Hebrew idiom that means the best song, right? The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. It means the highest, the best, the best. And so the best song that is ever sung, it's love poetry, romantic love poetry, full of desire between a couple that wants to be in covenant. So hear this at the outset. Sex is not shameful. Sex is not apart from God's design. In fact, in so many ways, it is original to his design. Something he saw as a part of his project, the human project, in which we represent God through our loving covenants with one another. So love is divine. Romantic love is participation with God. And we need to hear that loud and clear. Romance is not antithetical to God. I think some people end up portraying that way on accident. Love is like fire though. And it says that it's like a fire that can't be quenched. And that metaphor is potent because we know that fire in the right place can be life-giving. Imagine it in a fireplace or cooking over a stove, but fire in the wrong place can be really terrible for everybody involved. And so this is something we have to keep in mind. There is a place for sexuality. There is a redeemed way of viewing sex. There is a way to express sex that does not embrace the fallenness of sin. Let's realize that this is part of God's heart this romantic, amazing commitment that people express to one another through covenant love and covenant sexuality. It's something that God celebrates. He loves a good love story.
Good love stories give us hope. In Ephesians 5, Paul compares Christ's relationship with the church to that of a marriage partner. Do you see that what God is doing in marriage is something that actually gives us a glimpse of God? And so sometimes when we live outside of God's design for marriage, we actually read into God things that shouldn't be there. And so when we obey God in his design for marriage, we actually get a deeper glimpse of who he is. Revelation 21, the, the, the trajectory of hope within scripture ends with this, the bride of Christ. It ends with a wedding. So the Bible begins and ends with a wedding, with a consummation of romantic love. Sexuality is supposed to be a way we actually represent God and mysterious intimacy of two becoming one. So do you see this high view of sexuality? It's a high view of sex that embraces the call to purity, not a low view. And, and might I add that for those of you who have been a bit prickled by this emphasis on marriage, let me remind you that Paul talks about either singleness or marriage as a gift. In 1 Corinthians 7, he calls them both a gift. So there is a way for Christians who want to be invited into the intentions and the story of God to live out that love story as a single person. And there's also a way to live out that amazing story and testify to the character of God within the context of romantic love that aims and cherishes for covenant relationship, marriage. So I just want this to frame our conversation on sexuality an understanding that God's view of sex is very original to his plan for humanity. It matters because it testifies to God that we as images of God, living statues representing him, the way that we use our bodies can bring him great honor. Sex is not something that we should be afraid of talking about in the church. It's something that existed in the garden and, it, and it'll exist in the garden city. So with that kind of hope and joy and romance, may we find God's design for sexuality, something that we pursue with our lives. And just as all of the, God's intentions and God's contours of, of hope and blessing are reinterpreted through the cross, we're going to encounter what it looks like to live out the complexities of following God's view of romantic love, of covenant sexuality, and the context of following Christ in a broken world, aware of our own broken nature, our own broken views of ourselves, and the world's broken relationship with sexuality, a gift that has been abused and spoiled a fire that has been taken out of context. And thus we enter into the complexities of lived experience. This was a theological foundation for our conversation on sex. And I hope you'll join me in our next exploration as we talk about how to follow Christ into discipleship, into redeeming our sexuality and the complexities where our, our habits, our temptations, our views of sex, our views of each other, and even ourselves are all frustrated by the trauma of sin, the alienation we feel from God's design in our own hearts and in the hearts of those around us. And so, are you ready to have that conversation? So this will suffice as a theological foundation, as a theological starting point, a high view of God's joy, of romantic love. Don't be afraid of that exploration. Desire in and of itself is not a bad thing. This is where this starts. How do we direct it? How do we direct it toward the honoring of God? How is it transformed by the cross? These are things we will explore in our next Evo. I hope you'll join me then. I hope this has been helpful. 
And until next time, Godspeed.